This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh, we're back. We're back. We're on. It's 2 o'clock. Rock. We've been on for Here half we are on a given Wednesday. Exciting. This is a big day Wednesday. Yeah. This is the day before the storm. Storm, yeah. No storm, right? Storm, no storm. That's <laughs> Dave Heaney, yeah, yeah, right. former yeah. trustee of the Campbell Estate. Thank you, And Jay. also an author and teaches in... William and Mary. William and Mary. College of William and Mary. Excellent school. What did you 16, teach economics? 1693. Jesus. You know, second to have it. Actually, William and Mary was charted in 1611. But they must have had a board of regents like we have, because it took them 80 years to fund the place. In the meantime, this you know little place in Cambridge popped up. And the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're going to talk about Iceland, and in Iceland, sure. you know, they they started the legislature called the All Thing. That's right. It's in the, the oldest, year 930. That's yeah, the 930. oldest parliament in, in the world. Yeah, yeah. Still going strong, actually. Yeah, no, amazing part of the place. interparliamentary union. Yeah. The Secretary General of that was here a couple of weeks ago. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Iceland is his favorite place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's Iceland and Portugal, I think, on the tourist map right now yeah. tend to be hot spots. They're, they're out of the way somehow. Yeah. You know, they Over, had been overlooked for a long time. Yeah, um, they, and they, they don't have the same stresses and um, yeah. threats that other places <laughs> have. True. Yeah. So um, you've been writing books again. Trying. Actually, I've been writing books for a long time. Yeah. You started writing books when you were at Scheidler, no? Way back no, no, then? no. I, I started, you know, I was a former academaniac, or as we say in Hawaii, academia nut. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to get tenure at places like Wharton and Columbia where I taught, you, you know, it's publish or perish. So I, you know, I started writing there. I had to, uh, although that writing was the dry analytical stuff that that nobody ever reads, but it does get you tenure. <laughs> and so that once you get tenure, you can you then know, you can relax snooze, a little bit. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that I mean that got me into it, and but then you know as I got older and particularly got into business and so forth, wanted to write stuff that people actually read and uh, was able to do speaking tours off the book. So that's that's kind of when I went to do books like this, of which I've completed ten now. And this was Some not, people, this is by not... the way, Jay, have suggested that I've written more books than I've read. <laughs> it's a very unkind statement. How unkind. Yeah, unkind. right. Yeah. <laughs> probably right, though, right? Still yeah. unkind. Right, yeah. <laughs> so this is not the most recent one. That's no. the interesting part. Yeah. But in some ways, this is the one that's most interesting right now. No? Uh, it's always alive. I mean, this thing, this issue has really never died. Yeah. Yeah. They probably want to know what book we're talking about, so why don't you hold it up? Yeah, the book is called Flight Capital. Uh, it's about 13 years old now, but again, is uh, seems to always have a new life. And it was conceived in many respects right here in Hawaii when I started to notice a number of Hawaiians and others, Americans, particularly in the science, technology, medical areas, we're doing citizens, people who have been here 10, 20, 30, people who are highly successful, very well educated, gold chip kind of men and women. We're doing a U-turn and we're flying back to their homes of records, stuff they never did before. The kind of people you're talking about, though, are people who were born elsewhere. Born elsewhere. Who were not yeah. natively yeah. born here. And when they came here, I mean, the idea was it was a one-way trip. They weren't, they weren't doing a UE at all. They were yeah. tickled to death to get in the country. And yeah. Uh, land of opportunity, whether they were Albert Einstein or Alfred Hitchcock, they made a name for themselves. But increasingly, I started to see more of these middle and senior successful folks, men and women, doing an about face. And so I, you know, the question was, is this a trend or a trickle? Is, is something going on here? Why are they doing it? What are the implications for the United States? What would you, you know, should we do about it, if anything? Well, it's a business issue because it's, as you said, human capital, flight capital. Yeah. And this is the most valuable, human resource is the most valuable asset we can have. Especially and in a knowledge-oriented uh, economy, yeah. which we clearly are very much yeah. into. Yeah. But what's interesting to me, and I mentioned it to you before, is that we live in a state where we're worried about the brain drain, about people yeah. you know, living here, getting school here, right. but then leaving. Yeah. And so what are, we, what are we generating? We're generating this, this product that leaves on us. Uh, that's not a win-win situation. Uh, and so you have somehow 
taken that and examined it on a national level and not simply yeah. a state level. No I, no, I think that's right. And, and again, these people, uh, it, you know, it's one thing if you lose some bright people. Uh, it's another thing if alternatively you have not been developing your own homegrown talent, particularly in the STEM areas. And lo and behold, we haven't. I mean, kids today, uh, Jeff Immelt of GE has the great line, if the U.S. wants to lead the world in masseuses and sous chefs, we can do it. But China's going to lead the world in India, will, in artificial intelligence and brain surgery. And, and true, uh, you know, if you, if you look at kids majoring in stuff today in, in, in colleges and universities, uh, they, they typically shy away from this stuff. It's, 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 hard. Considered, it's hard, it's considered sort of geeky, antisocial, and uh, who needs it? I remember my own consciousness on this. It was when Bill Gates, he was then CEO, yeah. uh, was making a trip around the country visiting college campuses and trying to get kids, you know, mostly American right. kids, not, not imported from other countries, sure. but American, to study technology, and they wouldn't do it. And he couldn't find the talent he wanted to hire from Microsoft. Well, one day, about six months after this, like dawned on me from that article about right. him, um, we had a show here uh -huh. um, about Microsoft. Right. And we had a whole bunch of them. They were the best and the brightest in Microsoft. Sure. One was from uh, somewhere in the Middle East. Right. Uh, one was from Africa and one was from Asia. And none of them were born in the country. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what you had is, yeah, Bill Gates figured it out all right. You go offshore and you get them. And then you give them a life here. Yeah, and um, then you may recall, Jay, he built a monumental facility in Vancouver. Uh, uh, he Again, he couldn't capture them here, so he went across the border. And as you know, Canada has been very welcoming to exactly these kind of people, and he was able to fill it up. He also created in Beijing, there's a guy named Kai Fu Li, who's a legend in this sort of area. Uh, born in Pittsburgh, went to Carnegie Mellon, got all of his degrees there, joined Microsoft, went up like a rocket. And Gates sent him to Beijing to start Microsoft's Asia Pacific Laboratory which later MIT's Technology Review ranked as the best R&D center in the world, three years in a row, to the point where Gates twice a year went over there to essentially kiss the ring and keep this, <laughs> keep this guy going. But they, their, their major talent resource was in Beijing, and it was, again, with a lot of these same folks who had been plucked away from the U.S. When I talked to Lee, by the way, I said, what was the biggest obstacle you had? getting Chinese-born Americans or immigrants back to China. And he said, I mean, it sounds crazy, but the biggest problem we had was with the mothers. You know, the mothers on the mainland, you know, were so proud of their sons at MIT and Caltech and <laughs> Intel and so forth. When we try to bring them back, you know, they're just telling us, you know, I want to lose my bragging rights in the neighborhood. You know, what am I going to tell Millie across the street or what have you? He said it took seven or eight years to get over that. Yeah. Uh, but they, of course, did get over it yeah. in a big way. Yeah. So you have found that the lessons you learned when you wrote the book yeah. 13 years ago right. are still appropriate and are still true, maybe even more true now than then? Yeah, we're, well, we're, we're losing, on, on my average, 200 to 250,000 of these people a year, a year. Now, that excludes the people who ordinarily would have come here or would have considered the U.S. on a short list along with Australia, Canada, and some other places, who, you know, given the events of the times politically and so forth, have seen a chill in the air and uh, have been looking elsewhere. That's a huge number compared so, to the number who came in the first place. Yeah, it's a turnstile. So a lot of people, a lot of people, high percentage of people who came from other places right, are leaving. Are going back, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and which begs the question, why, why are they doing that? What, where are they going? And the interesting thing I found in doing it, as you may recall, I went to eight countries uh, to take a look at this. India, Ireland, Iceland, Israel, Taiwan, China, Mexico, um, and, uh, and China. Wh and where this phenomenon was going on. At, exists. at different levels, you know. Yeah. Mexico was like one and a half on a 10-point scale. Mm. Ireland was like a nine. Israel was right up there. Uh, India. China, sort of six, seven, and moving in that direction. And they were going back uh, 
for the same reasons people emigrate, in the first, and that's a better life as they define it. And it's typically a better life economically, politically, culturally for them, and if not them, their kids or their grandkids, as they define success in a better life. And they can get jobs in those countries now where they could not get the jobs, you know, a generation ago. Yeah, no, I mean, those countries, in, let's face it, they were either basket cases or near basket cases, and they had all sorts of political upheaval and, and uh, could have been very oppressive religiously or whatever for these people to, to kind of make progress. So the U.S. was a, a wonderful escape valve, but these companies, uh, countries, India and China, classic example, have come a long, long way. And, and also, uh, particularly the Asians have felt that uh, even in Silicon Valley, you know, where they've had so much success, they still get stereotyped as sort of geeky, and they, get, they can run the research lab in the staff areas, but in terms of getting into the C-suite in the corner office, they still, they still see some hostility or lack of opportunity, whereas if they go back to Bangalore or Beijing, that's not a problem. Well, Singapore and become uh, crazy rich. Yeah, crazy. Uh, that, that may change the whole model, no? Yeah, no, and <laughs> Singapore was one of the countries I visited, and they have, you know, this goes back to Lee Kuan Yew. Of course, Singapore has always, in his days, relied on expatriate uh, imported workers. 25% of the population today came to Singapore, the Lion City, from someplace else. And, and Lee Kuan Yew has his dream of making Singapore the Boston of Asia Pacific. Oh, he's, he was brilliant. Was a brilliant guy. Yeah. And uh, uh, one of the guys I spent some time with over there, Edison Liu, an interesting guy. He uh, born in Hong Kong. His parents were both doctors. They immigrated to the States in the Bay Area, both practiced medicine. He did all of his degree work at Stanford, then went on, taught at Duke, taught at Yale, and he was the director of the U.S. National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, wow. Maryland. What a talent. Incredible guy. I mean, <laughs> great, and a great guy. Really a fun, you'd, you'd enjoy this guy. But Singapore went after him and brought him there. They, had, they created a city called Biopolis, a major science city with seven specialties, including genomics and bioscience. That reminds and, me of Dwayne Goobler. I don't know yeah. if you knew him. He, no. He was um, a national quality, National Institutes of Health, um, infectious, the tropical infectious okay. disease guy that yeah. Ed Cadman brought out yeah, here. Sure. And Cadman and the medical yeah. school just that was started, they built a big fancy laboratory. Yeah. But in the meantime, he wasn't really getting the kind of incentives that he hoped for. Right. And when Duke contacted him out right. of Singapore, yeah. they gave him a whole building. No, that's what this, you know, this. Yeah. And, he, and he went there. Well, like that. Yeah, when I, when I saw Liu, I, I went, they were just basically sweeping the floor on this one of seven buildings in this, I mean, magnificent buildings in, in Biopolis. And he had, he had recruited 177 uh, bioscientists, including 80% of the, the, the uh, genetic gene tracing team from Paris. Uh, and, uh, you know, was just going crazy. And he said, you know, I asked him the big question. He said, are you really going to make hayway here? And he said, you know, in 10 years, we will have at least 10 major league bioscience companies coming out of Singapore. Yeah, that, I mean, I, when you mentioned before about the sous chefs and all that. Yeah, right. I, I, think, <laughs> I think the audience understand we're talking about brilliant people, right. top of the line, yeah. total type A achievers right. yeah. who are going to, our, who are presently changing the world. Yeah. And wherever they go, that place benefits by their presence. Yeah, yeah and, and these people, you know, there's a gene pool they're in, you know, it's called brain circulation, where there's a limited number of these people, and they are totally mobile to go any place, any time. And every country, if you're in biotech, nanotech, and a number of artificial intelligence, if you're a pilot with multi-engine experience, if you're a lawyer who has taken companies public today, uh, on the major exchanges, these guys are on the hit list of a, they are, of a, Ireland has, Enterprise Ireland has eight major cen centers in the United States. Staff would To have, recruit. To recruit. Exactly these guys. So what the factors then is, one is um, you can get a job overseas. Right. 
Two is you have family, probably, yeah. and it's a familiar thing, and you're right. happy that your country, the place you came from, is doing better now than it was before. Right. So it's a quality of life. It's not yeah. a bad life. Right. Um, and, and then finally you get, and this is really what I want to dwell on for a yeah. minute, is, is the incentives. Governments are throwing out incentives that are sometimes very valuable, very focused in order to bring people home. Yeah, yeah no question. Uh, China has a $2 billion at last count, budget to attract a group that are called sea turtles in Chinese. <laughs> They're homing, the Irish call them homing pigeons. <laughs> the Icelanders call them homing puffins. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, but they're all returnee type folks. So there, there are big budgets out there. Now, uh, China, some countries are using the public sector. Places like India, when you talk to in Infosys and uh, Wipro and all of the major companies, they basically say it's all being done by the private sector. They've basically said, we don't want the Indian government anywhere near this recruiting but effort. But in China, so, yeah, China, the, China, the Chinese government China, has got a program yeah, going. They're, they're, yeah, definitely. I remember it, it was yeah. one, it was one a researcher, biochemistry yeah. research in New Jersey, and he was, he was yeah. really making hay, sure. tremendous career. And one day they called him up and said, you should return now, yeah. and we're going to give you a laboratory right. that you know will make your head spin. Sure. And he went right back, and yeah. he, he's a happy guy. Yeah. Um, so I think you you know you're right. The recruiting right. is uh, some countries business, some countries government, but I think a focused approach is to um, offer him incentives that he will come back. The, but well, the, you know the start is for the government, and or in partnership with business, to look at a strategic plan of what kind of Singapore. Do we want to create in today's world? Once you've sorted that out, then it's how do we do it? Yeah. Do we grow our own? Do we pluck some from a, or some combination of the two? And and clearly a lot. I mean, a major plus. You know, we talk about how things have changed. Are the educational systems and the science, the research facility systems uh, in the industrial parks in these places has really jacked up. So there's, I mean, there's something major to come back to. What does a scientist love more than anything else? <laughs> this is rhetorical. More than anything else, he loves talking science with his colleagues. Sure. The yeah. fellow named Robert Olson and uh, the New Fitzsimmons, which yeah. is like a Tripler hospital in Denver. Right. Yeah. Used to be an army hospital, and they right. converted it to a, a, a scientific community there, yeah. uh, uh, an incubator sort sure. of there. Yeah. And, they, and, they, and they wanted to bring, you know, big pharma in there. Yeah. So what did they do? They, he, Robert yeah, Simmons, was, right. Robert Olson was running it, um, he organized breakfasts. Yeah. And uh, all the scientists would come to breakfast. Sure. And there'd be this unspoken understanding that you're not going to knock me off on my research. Right. You're not going to steal my work. Yeah, right, yeah. But I will talk to you and I will tell right. you what I'm doing and yeah. you will learn and we will all learn together. Yeah. We will all have that scientific experience, the psychic benefit of talking to our colleagues. And I think that's probably part of it. If you work so hard and you're such a big A achiever, right. it really, you need to discuss it with other people. No, no, you, you do. Uh, the French created a city, it's near Riviera, called uh, Sophia Antipolis, uh, near Nice Valbonne. And they have about 400 companies. Like IBM's European, and to some extent, global R&D facility is there. And, and that's been going on for some time. But it's... Uh, they're near University, Grenoble University and so forth, and it's, it's all, it, you know, has that character of a lot of interchange between these people. So now, the yeah. big question right. is um, United States, as one of those countries, um, how are we doing? What have we done to allow the other guys to take our best and brightest away? Uh, it's hubris. I think, you know, this is the country that everybody came to, uh, a nation of immigrants, uh, you know, let's face it, we got more out of Ellis Island than we did off the Mayflower. <laughs> and and so, you know, these people, without lifting a finger, these people just fell into our collective laps. Yeah. Again, the IM pays and you name it yeah. of the world, all yeah. over the place. Because of something we offered them, a, a notion, uh, freedom, democracy. Yeah. A better uh, life. A better life, better. Um, tolerance. Sure. Uh, hopefully, yeah. I mean, yeah, although yeah. it doesn't always work, yeah, yeah. Um, it's those ethical things right. that we offered them that made them want to come here. Yeah, and, and, and not to overstate this issue, we still have some major advantages. I mean, one of the guys that I 
get a quote in here from him, uh, who was the dean of the Tel Aviv uh, School of Law and who had taught at Yale, Michigan, and some other places, just said, you know, I was going through this, he said, Dave, don't boo-hoo the U.S. He said, there is no other country that has been, that is so open to outside. He said, I've traveled all over the place. I know what's going on in Israel. I know we're doing, but there's nothing like the U.S. in terms of providing a, a, a palette, a canvas upon which to create. So that, and, and our universities, particularly at the graduate level, are first class. We outspend every other country in R&D. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of pluses to the U.S. However, however, uh, it's, it's a, as Tom Friedman noted, uh, it's, it's a flat uh, planet that we're on and people are competitive and no nation can rest on its laurels, and other countries can and are of a mind today to pluck off that kind of talent. So if you, if you turn your back, whether if you're the market leader in Pepsi or whatever, uh, and you forget about your strengths and so forth, you can, get, you can get creamed. And if you look at our educational system, how that collectively has eroded horrifically Right up, right up from the early grades. From the, yeah, to, to the, you know, we're now, I think, behind Estonia in mathematics, <laughs> <laughs> that powerhouse. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and these, again, for these kind of people, ed educational systems, public education, incredibly important. The last thing they want to take a risk on is their kids' education. Well, let's assume that these things that are in place now, these, right. these factors, that you described continue. Let's yeah. assume that they take a natural course uh, in the same direction. You know, so there's more competition, right. more incentives by yeah. other countries yeah. or, or, or corporations right. uh, overseas. Let's assume that we're not paying attention to the schools, right. uh, that we're not incentivizing those kids, uh, those hundreds of thousands right. of Chinese that stay here. Sure. Um, what will happen in 10 or 20 years? Yeah, the good news, if there is any good news, is that to have a more level global playing field, i.e. to have other people playing the game under the tent of globalization. As we saw with India and China, I mean, hundreds of millions of people have seen their lives improve. That's a good thing. And in terms of supposedly world peace and understanding, <laughs> there ought to be a plus to that. Nonetheless, no nation can sit on its laurels because eventually it comes back to bite you in the butt we, yesterday's colleagues become tomorrow's competitors. And unless you're fulfilling the pipeline of your homegrown talent and you're losing it with these folks, it catches up with you. And, and how it catches up with you, Jay, is in deficits. If you look at foreign trade, trade, de deficits. trade deficits, particularly used to be in the old days, sugar and pine, who gave a damn? You know, those were sunset industries. You kissed them off and said, I understand that. You know, we can't compete any longer in those. But the hope was that on, in knowledge-oriented segments, we were at the top, of the top of the scale. And we were. And we were. But now we're losing. We're running deficits in a number of those advanced technology categories. And that's going to bite you in the ass yeah. sooner or later. You, yeah. can't, you cannot get away. And, and again, the, the rankings of our public schools you can't, you can't have a dung hole. I mean, we've been survived by, again, the graduate level success of 20 or so universities. Well, you're suggesting we could take affirmative steps Absolutely. to reverse the process sure, of, sure. of flight capital. No question. Um, what, what do we do? And, and if, you don't, if you don't mind, can you compare it with what they did in Iceland? Yeah, I, th yeah, I mean, what you, <laughs> what, what you can do is, I don't want to get back into Reaganomics and Thatchernomics, but... Uh, uh, for, for, I mean, the Irish were the first, you know, the Celtic Tiger, where they, uh, you know, it took the public education system, which had stopped at the seventh grade, uh, up through college. They were going into the EU, so the foreign language training became very, very important. They overhauled the infrastructure. They cut taxes, cut tariffs, uh, created industrial parks, were able to talk Intel, Microsoft, and other people to come over there and... Uh, and they were off and running. Uh, Iceland and others, Singapore took a page out of, the, out of that book. So that, I mean, that's part of it, but you do have to, 
there are two things. One, one is you have to, you somehow have to get more of your homegrown talent interested in these areas. And people like, I mean, Gates is, you know, Andy Grove at uh, Craig Barrett at Intel, uh, Sally Ride before she went, I mean, getting women uh, interested in science where evangelists, and you need more of that. And we, we definitely have to have to do that. And then you've got to, you know, you've got to be smart about your immigration policies. And I suggest in the book then, as people have today, that uh, our immigration policy, which has been so skewed almost 70 percent to family reunification um, and only 20 percent to skills acquisition, should be flipped. I'm not saying it ought to be 80-20, but uh, probably half of it ought to be devoted towards these kind of bright As people. As a practical matter, this, yeah. is a, this is a competitive global marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. We need that right. talent. We need the flight capital. Yeah, Without the flight capital, we lose the competition. Yeah. I, I, again, that's not a problem if you're growing people are coming out as colleges up the yin-yang in nuclear medicine and so forth, but that's not the case. Today. Yeah, no, it's yeah. very competitive. Yeah. You know? yeah. I, I, remember, uh, I remember reading, this has got to be 10 years ago, that yeah. somewhere in, in the area of Beijing, probably in Tianjin, yeah. they had a particle accelerator. Yeah. Oh my God, Yeah. a particle accelerator? My, that's this, this, we'll look, I thought we had a lock on those things, but we, we don't. We'll look at India and China. I mean, they, they both have space programs. They're both very much committed to try to put a man on the moon. Uh, China in artificial intelligence, people will tell you, are way ahead of the United States today. Well, after a while, yeah. it, it bites you. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm wondering what the government could do in terms of incentives to students here, yeah. everybody's students, sure. every, all right. students, yeah. to make them study science, to make it cheap for them, to uh, support um, you know, scientific sure. research sure. in yeah. a big way, right. um, you know, to just take off and be the world leader. Sure. I, I actually think if, if, if government policy were focused on this, we could recover. We could change this phenomenon, get off the slope right away, and come back. No, I, I mean, a lot of this is in the last chapter of the book. I mean, there's such an opportunity out there. We could cream, basically, almost anybody else. I mean, people would, when you look at where you want to go, generally, this, you know, this place, is, the U.S., is highly attractive. Uh, the people that I ran into, a number of them that went back, though, I mean, what bothers them is sort of the discourse, the, the coarseness, uh, the vulgarity, uh, bare midriffs, tattoos. I mean, there are all sorts of things. Uh, one scientist uh, from New Jersey, he and his wife, uh, went back to India and said, you know, the day I discovered my kid's middle school was spending more on medical de met, uh, metal detectors than on mathematics, I told my wife, we're out of here. Uh, so it's, it's that, I mean, that stuff really grabs a lot of these, it's a major, major turnoff. I remember a story in the paper maybe a year ago about an Indian <laughs> law professor right in a place like uh, Missouri yeah and his wife was a doctor they were right. achievers and sure. all that yeah <clears throat> but some Indian fellow had right. been murdered on the street right. in a street crime yeah and uh, they didn't feel that justice was being done they right. felt afraid yeah and the two of them and they made public statements yeah. in fact left the country yeah they sure. couldn't tolerate the the quality of life it's not what they were working for yeah and they had credentials they could sell oh, yeah. elsewhere sure so we run the risk of creating an environment which turns people out. No question about it. And I think this is everybody's business. Everybody has to pull together. I mean, if you had to, if you had to tell the average Joe Schmo on the street, if you had to talk to America, Dave, yeah. then, what would you say to them about I this? I would say get on an airplane for a start. If you don't have a passport, which I think is the situation of about half of the people in Congress, <laughs> uh, get a passport, get on an airplane, and get stuck into China and India. Just go through there and see what the hell is going on. Uh, this ain't rickshaw territory anymore. I mean, get see what's happening in other pockets around the world and realize that's, that's, the, that's the swimming pool your kids, your grandkids are going to be competing in. And, uh, you know, we either get on that wagon or you get run over. <laughs> that, that's simple. 
and that will make America great, great again. Great again. There you go. Not tariffs, <laughs> no, no. but that. There you go. Yeah. Thank you so much, My Dave. pleasure. Great all, to talk to you. All the best, you. yeah.